What's happening, hardscapers? This is episode 105 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk to you about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today's episode is brought to you by IQ Power Tools, the firm that builds smart, tough, award-winning, clean-cut concrete and masonry power tools that eliminate dust. Go check them out at iqpowertools.com and on their social channels at IQ Power Tools. And today we're joined by Brad Burgesson. He is the product manager at Terrafix Geosynthetics. And he joins us today to talk everything geogrids, uniaxial, biaxial, installation, and everything you need to know. So let's get into it. Today we're joined by Brad Bergerson. He is the product manager of Terrafix Geosynthetics, and he is here today to talk with us about everything GeoGrid. Brad, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us here. Thanks for having me. Brad, let's get started to get to know a little bit more about yourself. Uh, your What brought you to this point in time and working for Terrafix? Can you give our audience a little bit of context about yourself? Well, actually, it's a funny story. I kind of, uh, you know, fell uh, randomly into the geosynthetic world and, and the landscaping uh, side of things. I had originally went to school for uh, architectural technology. And uh, when I first uh, graduated, I was pretty excited and eager just to get a job, whoever would hire me. So I actually ended up uh, originally with a landscape architect and that, um, you know, that brought me into the world of landscape, uh, geosynthetics. I had randomly actually seen, um, you know, a Terrafix spec sheet on the wall in the landscape architect's office. And uh, that's when I first heard of Terrafix. Anyways, I, I realized, you know, maybe drafting for landscape architect, it was not really what uh, what I dreamed of doing. I didn't really like it. So I looked at other opportunities and kind of fell into almost a, a technical sales role, um, a very early uh, technical sales role with the Terrafix Geosynthetics. And uh, I did take a break from that. And, and I'd done a few other uh uh, career paths. I'd worked for the um, provincial government, uh, but ultimately I uh, wound back up uh, in technical sales with Terrafix Geosynthetics. Um, and uh, along the way, also I had uh, gone to McMaster University for uh, their civil engineering infrastructure uh, um, program, and uh, that kind of uh, opened my eyes and gave me a good grasp about what's going on in the civil side of things. So I'd say between my work experience and what I've studied in uh, in school, I've, I've got a good uh, understanding of what's going on about the, the landscape, uh, the architecture, and, and the civil engineering side of things. And that's where I am today and uh, moved through a few different positions at Terrafix, but currently uh, working as a product manager for our, our engineered system. So I work with our engineering design team, uh, design retaining walls, the large infrastructure uh, applications, and, and also major projects. So the um, big design, build, finance, maintain projects that you'll see large consortiums teaming up to deliver throughout Ontario. So hopefully that's a quick little summary. Yeah. And then, sorry, uh, mo most importantly, a bit about Terrafix. Um, we, uh, well, Terrafix was originally uh, started in 1973, um, really just selling geotextile back, back in those days and well before my time. Uh, geosynthetics for use in the civil and landscape field, they were not really well known. It was really you know, an innovative product, even just geotextile. So what most uh, landscapers and, and this industry would just call, you know, landscaping fabric, uh, weed barrier, things like that. Um, that. That alone was a very innovative product. So it started off with a few products, geotextiles, then uh, you know, geogrids came along and then all different sorts of geogrids. And then you had your, uh, your other products, um, unique erosion control uh, blankets came into play. Then you've got all your sub drain and, um, and retaining walls, mechanically stabilized earth structures, geogrids and retaining walls. And, and it really innovated from there. So Terrafix really was a North American um, kind of pioneer in this industry and the distribution and promotion and technical support and design of these products. And uh, taking us all the way up to 2021, um, the original owner recently sold uh, a few years back and now we're, we're now owned by uh, a large American company, Haynes. Uh, they're owned by a company called Legan and Platt. That's our, our the parent company. And um, yeah, so we it's great. We got a lot of support from them, and that's allowing us to do a lot of expansion uh, in areas we might not have been able to in the past. So look forward to a to a bright future uh, with Terrafix and lots of things happening. So it's a quick uh, quick intro of Terrafix. 
Absolutely. And coming from my background and experience it at a landscape supply uh, yard, specifically with geogrids and these geotextiles, they weren't really embraced. And this was, I guess, dating back to about 2007, 2008 by the contractors. They uh, weren't quite being installed at the time. But since that my time there, I've seen this kind of progression towards using these geotextiles, using these geogrids in the builds. We always see geogrids spec'd in retaining wall installations. But then, you know, we've had an introduction into, you know, def many different types of geogrids, their uses and their where they can be used in the install for landscape construction business owners and those installs. So I want to get down into what geogrid is the different types, how they're made to really help our audience kind of understand it more and what it can help them with with their installs. I know a lot of guys listening already are using it, but it's always great to have, you know, the your your take on this to understand it uh, fully in depth. So let's get started with what are the different types of geogrids that are on the market, especially that Terrafix has. Two main types of grids we're using are biaxial and uniaxial. Um, for example, the biaxial geogrids were, you know, the, the original geogrid, let's say, and that was the, basically the black um, uh, square strength in both direction, original geogrid. And they're um, typically made out of a uh, polypropylene, the, the TBX line of uh, geogrids we sell. Um, yeah, they're made out of polypropylene. So, and they're, the manufacturing of those are pretty simple. It just consists of extruding a flat sheet of plastic um and then they're punched in a controlled pattern of holes uh what you'll hear referred to as apertures uh, and then stretching the sheet in both directions orienting the polymers um, developing the tensile strength um and each you know each process each strain each thickness it's refined from there to get the different uh the different strengths uh and, and you would see if you're comparing um side by side our geogrids you'll see um you know, thicker ribs, larger um, junctions, different sized apertures. Um, and, and that's how you would kind of get your different strengths and different flavors of the uh, biaxial geogrid. And the biaxial geogrid, um, very commonly used for subgrade reinforcement under roads, driveways. We get a lot of landscapers now using this product um, under pathways, walkways, patios, wherever there's poor soil, um, this, this product is going to be a good solution. Uh, the major benefit really to everyone with this product is for many, many years, um, one company basically held the patent on the manufacturing process of this. When that patent came up, anyone could start manufacturing these. So really the market was flooded with this product. The price probably dropped about at least, uh, it's a quarter of the price it used to be when it was a patented product. So it became uh, really cost effective for you know just homeowners landscape contractors to start using these and even in situations where it wasn't specified on the contract documents a good landscape contractor typically has some of this sitting around and saying you know i'm going to put some down anyways because you know maybe if they have to warranty the job or they you know, they, they they really value the work they do they'll add some of this because the extra cost is is not significant then we're jumping into the uh, second type of grid um, and this is the type of grid you would use predominantly in retaining walls, um, and it's a uniaxial geogrid. And uh, the method here is uh, it's a combination of high tenacity polyester or polypropylene yarns. They're typically twisted together. Um, the single yarns are then weaved or knitted, uh, forming flexible junctions. And, and then they're typically coated with an additional kind of protective layer, um, let's say a, a PVC or bitumen coated material or some sort of latex. Um, and these are the more flexible grids. A biaxial geogrid, the polypropylenes, you'll see they're, they're pretty rigid. The polyester, um, the biaxial geogrids that are used in retaining walls, the uniaxial strength in one direction, they're very flexible, almost, almost like a fabric because you know, you've got that polyester. And uh, also good for when you're placing them in between, uh, let's say, uh, block walls, things like that. You don't get your blocks sitting on a solid grid in between each block and therefore you can get wobbling. These kind of just work to the block and they're squished in between the block and, and that's where you get your, your interlocking with the block. Um, yeah, actually one, one other 
quite unique type of grid. Um, not as common, but it's actually a, a combination grid. And maybe my colleague Isabel may talk about this later on when she's talking about geotextiles, but um, it's a product called CombiGrid. And it actually combines um, a geotextile with the geogrid. So you're getting your uh, biaxial reinforcement and soil separation. So speaking to innovation in the industry and, and, and what's new and, and what kind of uh, interesting things are happening, it's products like this that come out, you know, combining two products into one um, saves contractors quite a bit of time um, in, you know, having to roll out the geotextile and a geogrid. And, and that's, that's an interesting product uh, too. Um, it's typically, you know, the extrude flat polymer, or sorry, polyester polypropylene ribs. Uh, they're passed over rollers running at different speeds. It stretches the ribs, orientates them properly. Um, and then they're fed into welding equipment where they're cross machined and actually welded together. And then adhered to um, a, a textile sort. And that textile can range in different um, thicknesses and whatnot. Uh, Isabel will get more into the geotextiles. I don't want to steal her thunder, but um, yeah. So, so really two major types. And then, you know, there's always innovations off those. So getting into this, uh, lots of lots of questions just came up into my mind from that. With that that soil reinforcement aspect of geogrids, um, now I've seen guys do many different ways. I've seen guys wanting to use that geotextile. Maybe that's where that new product comes into play. You know, the geotextile uh, separator between the base and the subsoil. And then doing, say, four inches of base material and then a biaxial and then four inches of base material and their pavers in a patio application. Uh, is that something that you you would suggest or was, I've also seen, you know, guys using the biaxial at the very base instead of the fabric as a soil separator and uh, reinforcement. How does that look in terms of what you would recommend? It's always good to have the textile as a soil separation. Um, if you're the brand new material you're putting in. I mean, typically you're putting in something that's gonna be a good base for, for patios or pavers, whatever you may be, a driveway. Um, if you're working in an area where there's similar material and you don't really care or you're not worried about that soil eventually, you know, let's say pumping up and, and mixing in with your base course. Um, but textiles are also so cost effective these days that to just throw down that soil separation, I, if it was my project, I would definitely recommend it. Um, a soil separation, it's just going to add to the longevity of that base you're building up. And then, of course, uh, you know, for most landscape applications, um, unless it's very, very poor soil or you have heavy loading on that landscaping area, uh, typically one layer of biaxial geogrid is enough. But you can imagine, we, um, we also offer full design on on uh, subgrade reinforcement. So there's sometimes when on the other spectrum, we're working on you know, a huge concentrated load crane pad, and you know there could be multiple layers up to let's say four layers of different geo grids in that, uh, in that design. So, but, but for, more, for most landscape applications, we're looking at just a soil separation and then your, your one course. Definitely. And then when it comes to that and choosing the, the correct biaxial geogrid strength for a uh, soil re reinforcement. Is there is there a rule of thumb that we can go by in terms of choosing the right product for that application? Or is this something that you guys have specs already introduced in, in terms of what, uh, you know, what strength of biaxial geogrid you, and, and you, you mentioned the size or the aperture. What does that look like? It's hard to give a, a general answer on that because usually it's, it's looked upon case by case. Um, you know, we're going to look at ultimately the project's going to have a geotechnical report um, where we can look at um, the surrounding soil conditions. Uh, then we're going to look at um, the potential loading that they're putting on this. I mean, landscape applications are, are pretty light duty applications compared to some of the uh, the other types of projects we work on, like I mentioned, crane pads or uh, highway projects. So really you can get away with your basic geogrids. We have, um, we have a few different, uh, we have a few different um, strengths of geogrid ranging from a TBX 1500 all the way up to a TBX 3000. And then of course, a whole ton of specialty grids, but typically 
um, a geogrid from our TBX line, which is just stands for Terrafix Bioxo Geogrid, um, suffices for landscape projects. And we have a whole ton of spec sheets, uh, commercial specifications that for landscape architects, if they're putting something into a tender and they want to make sure you know the landscape contractor is going to be doing something and using the correct product. Um, but you know, you had mentioned a few years back where this stuff wasn't that common. I do see a lot more awareness of these products. I mean, we we uh, we attend tons of different sh trade shows every year at Landscape Ontario, uh, the Building Show, or Building Connected Construct Canada, whatever they're they're calling it. Sorry, these days, but and we see a lot of homeowners that are getting really interested into these type of products. So you know, they may have a landscape contractor working on their their home or their their property, and they say, "Hey, man, try using this product or this." And so it's it's pretty interesting, but. A regular TBX line usually suffices for landscape applications. And getting into, say, a retaining wall application, uh, what does that look like in terms of the correct geogrid to use? Can you use biaxial geogrid in a retaining wall application, or do you prefer to, you know, to suggest to stick to that uniaxial? What does that look like? Well, I get that question uh, quite a bit um, from contractors who have maybe this is their first time working on you know, a retaining wall with geogrids. And I always recommend um, a uniaxial geogrid, hands down. I don't even need to think about that answer. Um, in theory, for a smaller retaining wall, you know, a few courses high uh, in a residential application, your biaxial geogrid would in theory work and sh the wall shouldn't fail. But um, when we're designing, um, and if it's up to us, 100%, we are always recommending a, a, a uniaxial geogrid. I just want to take a moment from today's episode to thank IQ Power Tools for being a sponsor of today's episode. This episode is brought to you by IQ Power Tools, the firm that builds smart, tough, award-winning, clean-cut concrete and masonry power tools that eliminate dust. Eliminating dust from your job site is smart, it saves time, it saves money, and it saves lives. Keep your job site safe and healthy for you and your crew as well as the neighbors and the homeowner around you and look professional while you're on the job site with these IQ Power Tools dust eliminating systems. Visit them at iqpowertools.com and learn how to implement healthier and more efficient work practices for your next project and give them a thanks on their social channels at IQ Power Tools for sponsoring the How to Hardscape podcast. Now back to our episode. I'll, I'll put myself on the spot here with that. Uh, when I'm building a smaller raised patio, what I'll do is I will tie it all together with a biaxial. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can picture like going from one side to the other and, mm -hmm. you know, wrapping in the, the the enclosed sides as well with that biaxial. Is that mm -hmm. a proper installation? Would you would you say that that would uh, be correct or would you prefer to see uniaxial going through? Um, not necessarily wrapping in, you know, more than one side, but kind mm -hmm. of tying that uh, raised patio in. No, you know, that that design also works works well because I've seen, um, and actually in a lot of the uh, retained slope systems, um, we design and supply. So, you know, picture a, a retaining wall, but just a slope with geogrids in it. A lot of our slopes, actually, we incorporate a biaxial geogrid reinforced base because with what you're talking about, you're getting that subgrade reinforcement on your patio, but you're also getting that slope face stabilization and strengthening with the wrapped face. So yeah, nope, that, that works perfect. And getting into the installation, um, is there a, a spec amount of, you know, if you're putting it in between your base, is there a spec amount of, you know, how many, however many inches you need above and below each layer of geogrid or uh can you explain that a little bit a good rule of thumb is trying to get it as deep as possible into your base um and typically a, you know a minimum four to six inch overlay um before your top surface is really what you're trying to achieve um of course in a in a landscape application uh, whether it's a commercial landscape or, or home um you know you could be a bit a bit loose with some of those requirements, but really just try and get as deep as possible and minimum four to six inch overlay. Yeah, I, I assume that, you know, when it comes to using GeoGrid in our industry, where you said it's not like we're building these major structures, it's it's a driveway at the at the most and then, you know, backyard outdoor living space. Just 
implementing some sort of soil stabil stabilization, base stabilization method, such as a geogrid is, is just, you know, that that's going above and not above and beyond, but that's kind of, uh, it's great that you're doing it. It's, it's going to add that stability. So just knowing that you are actually putting in that extra step for your customer is, is a big thing with these geogrids. So definitely uh, get these geogrids installed into your bases, into your soil, soil stabilization Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when, when I see these products being used on, yeah, on these type of landscape applications, I, I definitely kind of, I applaud the contractor, I applaud the landscape architect because anything you're putting in um, is going to extend the life of that product or uh, project significantly. You've got to imagine a lot of, a lot of these products are being used on in the, uh, on MTO projects, for example, where we have to rate these systems and, and these products and these designs uh, up to 75 year design service life. Um, I work on some major infrastructure projects where we're putting in geogrids in our retaining walls, and we need to rate those up to 125-year design service life. So you can imagine any of these products you're putting into a, a, a landscape, commercial, residential application, yeah, you're way ahead of the game. So then what would you say to the naysayers, the people that are say, you know, it, it, you know, going back to my supply experience, uh, that it's just trying to upsell, you know, a contractor on, you know, purchase this product so that we as the supply yard and as the manufacturer can make more money. What would you say to those people uh, that uh, don't believe in this kind of well, reinforcement? Yeah. And, and I, <laughs> I have that conversation uh, at least a few times a week with, you know, a contractor that's set in his ways and, uh, you know, he's, he's, He's pulled a tender. He's been in the project, and he sees, uh, "Hey, what what the hell is a geogrid, or what's this? I don't know. Someone specified it. Tell me all about it." So, I I I, I go through that quite a bit. Um, and, and like in like innovations in any industry or any product, you're gonna have uh, you know, old schoolers that uh, are just set in their ways. They they do amazing work, and what they've been doing works well. Um, but innovations happen, and in my personal experience, um, they usually don't get on board with these until they're forced to, whether it be a landscape architect specified it um, and it's in the tender, uh, the contract documents, or a homeowner is really pushing them to use it. They, they may have seen it somewhere and they're pushing for it. Uh, but the feedback, I would say, is always very positive. Um, after they say, you know, Brad, that was a things went well. Hey, look at these pics. Uh, these photos, the site, the owner was happy. They're always very proud of what they've just done. And after that, I see them, you know, they, they embrace it, let's say. And it's just, I tell them it's, it's another tool in their toolbox. Um, and it just puts them so far ahead of other contractors that may not be embracing these type of products yet. And as I mentioned, one of the key things here, the prices of these products have come down so They've just come down uh, to be to become so affordable for really anyone's budget over, I'd say, the past 10 years that it just makes sense to use them. I, I agree so much. And like you said, the price, it's it's cheap insurance. It's inexpensive insurance to install. And it also helps us as contractors present something to our customers and even if we have like a little square cut out of that geo grid to show our customers on that initial consultation hey this is how we're going to build it this is what sets us apart from the competition in terms of building and this is what it's going to do for you in the long run i i couldn't agree anymore yep and and actually i'd just like to add to that because uh, you know when when customers when uh, clients uh, when they see the physical product that always goes a long way so for any contractors out there that may be thinking about using this or proposing to use it uh, to any of their clients, uh, feel free to give us a call. Uh, Terrafix, you can stop by any time and uh, we'll cut you a sample of that. We'll give you a, you know, a hard technical package, brochures, a good presentation package that you can really present to your clients um, on site in a meeting. Uh, it, it goes a long way when they actually see the product and, and see what it's going to do. And from my standpoint, a big part of my job is, is just the uh, you know, presenting to consultants, presenting to landscape architects, presenting to contractors, owners. I mean, a big part of my job is just getting the message out about this product uh, and supporting it technically. So, hey, if you have any contractors that may listen uh, to your show here and they, they're trying to push something like this on a project, hey, we're totally free to come help them uh, present to the client, the customer. Um, I mean, no project's too small or too big. We work on 
private residences all the way up to you know the biggest highways being built in North America. So we're here to support anything and, and try and push this ahead. That's yeah, that's great to hear that you guys kind of provide that support to contractors. And having said that, when it comes to the technical aspects of what is it about GeoGrid that provides the support in a project, that soil reinforcement, that base stabilization, whatever it is, what what is it about it that provides that that support? What are the technical aspects of it that we can kind of use to present to the customer so that we kind of know what we're talking about so that we're not just saying, oh, it's just some mesh that we put in there that it stabilizes it. That's all you need to know. Yeah. So really to, to simplify it in a few sentences, because this in itself is, you know, it could be a whole hour, two hour long uh, conversation presentation, but geogrids work by interlocking, um, the granular or soil material placed over them. Um, so the apertures allow for the strike through of the cover soil material, um, which uh, basically the, uh, how can I put it? Um, it just is really locking everything together, almost like a snowshoe. So you picture, you know, you walk down, you're walking through snow and just, you know, your regular boots, you're gonna sink. With the geo grid, you're kind of a uh, spreading the load across that base, and, and it's really it's it's supporting what's above. So, really, just a support and interaction, and that's why the aperture size um, is is important because and and also that in conjunction with using um, the proper uh, material in there, you want kind of a well graded angular material because it's that angular material that's going to really get uh, interlocked with those apertures and then mixed with some compaction you're getting a very very solid uh structure there as opposed to you can imagine if you're just using uh, beach sand to try and put this all together you don't have the beach sand being able to compact and interlock really well with with those apertures right and anything else in terms of geogrid that you'd want our audience to know before we kind of close things down here uh can can you actually expand on that that strike through uh what that exactly means in terms of the geogrid uh we we our audience does know quite a little bit about geogrid I, i'm sure and a lot of guys are implementing this but that strike through has come up uh before and can you explain and expand on that a little bit more so the strike through is key because you, you got a picture, let's say uh, uh, for, for a retaining wall application, let's say you pour your soil in uh, behind the wall without geo grid backfill compact. Okay. You, you know, you've got your compaction walls backfilled, everyone's happy, but with the geo grid, for example, you've got horizontal strips, you're putting in your material. When I'm designing and working with a retaining wall, I, I, I like to use a granular B type two uh, that gives you your nice, angular stone and you've got to imagine you're pouring your stone in it's going over the geogrid the geogrid has apertures whether they're you know one by one inch two by two what whatever it may be every every type has its different sizes but you're getting that material going in and it's getting a strike through so it's now once it's compacted it's now basically locking in each layer of geogrid um i re we recommend compaction of up to 95 percent uh, behind a retaining wall minimum uh, and I always tell people the retaining wall and that reinforced zone with geo grid behind there and with that interlocking and strike through of the granular angular material combined with the compaction 95%, that whole area is the equivalent of pouring in concrete. Um, that's how strong that, that and solid that structure is now, as opposed to no geo grid, you're throwing it in there, compacting, just really hoping that the weight of the wall itself is going to support that. Yeah, that's an incredible visual. And to understand that a little bit more uh, provides a lot of context. Brad, anything else that you want to talk about in terms of GeoGrid that you don't think that we covered here that you think would be valuable for our uh, audience to know? Well, for the landscape contractors out there, because I deal with this uh, at least once a week, when you are using GeoGrid and a retaining wall, uh, make sure, the uniaxial especially, make sure you roll it out the right way. Mm. Please. Mm -hmm. I get contractors calling all the time saying, hey, I just built a wall, but I rolled out the uniaxial this way. I said, oh, that's the wrong way. Ooh. And a lot of the time they need to rip that wall out and rebuild it. When you're using uniaxial, 
please make sure you roll it out the right way. In terms of finding that right way, what what is it? Yep. Is there so, arrows on the grid or what? Well, so you you'll pretty clearly see, um, you know, it, visually, um, you can see it has its strength in one way. It has the large bands running in one direction. That's the proper direction. But the rolls are 1.83 meters wide. So sometimes what contractors will do is they'll just roll out a one point, you know, they'll roll that whole length of the roll down the length of the retaining wall because that's quick and easy and simple. But what they're actually supposed to do is roll it out uh, perpendicular to the wall and the roll. Um, and that involves having to cut each strip back, which of course is a bit more work. That's why we see it being installed occasionally, you know, the wrong way, unfortunately. Um, one rule of thumb here is you're gonna wanna use GeoGrid at least 80% the height of the retaining wall to a minimum of 2.5 meters back um, for really a GeoGrid uh, to benefit the retaining wall. Uh, so, so that's why that 1.83 meter wide roll, not only is it not long enough, even if it was in the right direction, um, you're, you're, only, you're not getting any strength because that grid is just strong in one direction. So please always take that in consideration, landscape contractors. Got it. And that brings up, sorry, one question that comes to mind here is if we're doing a larger project, uh, is it beneficial to go with the, the longer role as possible to cover that area of the project? Or does it does it really uh, make a difference if all we have available is that that smaller role and just having to roll out uh, more to cover the entire you know length of a project, let's say? Uh, is, is there a benefit with going to... Uh, going extra lengths to get that larger roll or no. is it okay to go with that small yeah. roll? Well, yeah, no, it's fine to go with that small roll. And actually most of the rolls we sell are standard sizes. So really instead of rolling that whole roll out parallel to the wall, strips are just cut off and laid perpendicular to that, to the, you know, to the face of the wall and going back to the slope. So your, your length of the, your roll doesn't really matter. Your width of the roll doesn't really matter. And, and it's as quick, too, as, hey, uh, you know, we, we all have cell phones. We all have email. Everyone's glued to their computers. I mean, it's as simple as I get my con landscape contractors that I deal with regularly. They'll just text me a photo and say, hey, Brad, am I doing this right? And trust me, it saves a lot of time and money just to peace of mind know that, okay, my guys on site have rolled out this geogrid the proper direction. Because other than that, it's really near impossible to screw up. As long as you're getting your compaction and it's the right direction, there's not much that can go wrong with this stuff. Pretty user friendly. And when it comes to geogrids, no overlap. Does that count with retaining walls as well as say a patio soil stabilization? Well, with the subgrade reinforcement, we do recommend an overlap. Gotcha. Um, with retaining walls, just side by side, near touching, almost touching, few millimeters apart, not as crucial. It's not rocket science. So retaining wall geogrids, uniaxials don't need to be overlapped side by side. And that overlap for the soil stabilization, do you guys have a recommended amount? Uh, it, it ranges depending on uh, kind of what what the loading, what the subgrade. I mean, it can be, you know, it can be six inches, 12 inches, uh, very poor soils where they expect maybe some movement. It can be even even wider. So that's something we would look at on a case by case basis. Brad, thank you so much for taking the time and I explaining all these concepts to us. It really helps us uh, grasp, this, grasp this concept more of using GeoGrid and to be able to present it confidently to our customers to show how we differentiate ourselves from other contractors in the market. Having said that, is there anything, anywhere that you can point our audience to learn more about GeoGrids to see all the other products that Terrafix has to offer? Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our webpage has all our technical specifications, documents on it. Um, we, uh, we have webinars going on regularly. I, I recommend signing up for those. Uh, they're pretty informative. Anyone can sign up, landscape contractors, homeowners, um, anyone in the industry. Uh, a lot of the theories I had verbally tried to uh, explain, there's tons of interesting videos and, and visuals online that would really, you know, uh, help people understand the whole interlocking and uh, punch through I'd, I'd explained. Um, yeah, I mean, you hopefully are, you have our, my contact info after this. Uh, feel free. Any, anyone can call anytime. Uh, like I said, we can, we can get a technical package together and samples there. We're, we're happy to speak with your client, landscape 
architect. We go out to sites. Um, we do site visits, site meetings, uh, site reviews. Yeah, everything. And I, all this is at no cost to the contractor or owner. Um, I mean, that's that's the cost of business for Terrafix. That's the business we're in, uh, supporting these products technically. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there. I don't want to call them fly-by-night companies, but a lot of product companies out there selling these type of products. But I would say Terrafix is the industry leader when it comes to the sales and also technical support. We don't just sell a product and wipe our hands of it. Uh, we're out there from start to finish. We want to make sure you specify the right product, are using it correctly. Um, and we like to see the project, the site. Uh, we're there all the way. Questions pop up. We don't just sell product and abandon it. We're, we're there 110%. Feel free to call us anytime, anyone. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Yep. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Visit us at howtoheartscape.com for more information on the subject. Let us know what you want to learn about in future episodes by reaching out to us on our social channels. We are at How to Hardscape or send us an email, contact at howtoheartscape.com. And we'd love it if you subscribe to this podcast, left a rating and review, and go thank IQ Power Tools for sponsoring the How to Hardscape podcast. And go check out their award-winning clean-cut concrete and masonry power tools that eliminate dust at iqpowertools.com. We look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.